Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear partners and friends. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this session of our series, The World Handcuffed, uh, and a time when many of you are probably already on vacation, uh, including myself. Um, but this series is not on vacation yet. We have two more sessions. This one is the last, but one before our short summer break, and it's the last. Um, in this role at the moment where we look at institutions. We've been looking at the, the CSTO, we've been looking at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and today we are going to look at an institution that has been especially on our hearts and minds uh, over the last month, especially for me uh, and us as Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Um, since uh, this was, on a personal note, my last business trip before Corona struck, and now today is the time uh, to speak about this. So welcome to all of you on behalf of uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Belarus and the Minsk Dialogue. Um, we have again an all-star panel that will discuss how the COVID pandemic will affect uh, the Eurasian um, Economic Union and the outset that it finds itself in what will change, what may alter uh, by the pandemic, what might be the same, how priorities will be affected or might not be effective, and how all of this translates back into security in Central and Eastern Europe. Welcome to all of you who join us today on Zoom, where we're live and all the... We have English and Russian, as always, as our working languages. So if you need interpretation between these languages, please join us on Zoom. Um, and we will have, as always, um, a panel discussion at the beginning and later we'll be open to hearing your questions. You can post them both on Zoom and on Facebook. Now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Johini, who will be the moderator for the main part of the discussion today. Looking forward to an intense exchange of minds. Спасибо большое, Якоб, и традиционные слова благодарности. These star speakers. We shall start with a well known to a Belarusian audience, and uh, actually, many speakers here are well known both to the Belarusian audience and the audience of the Minsk dialogue. But I think Andrea Ruskovich is one of the better known people, and one of the important affiliations of him is that he is the chairman of, um, of the Belarusian State University. Uh, uh, He's head of the chair of Belarusian State University. He's deputy chairman of Standing Committee on International Affair, uh, Affairs and National Security of the Council of the Republic of the National Assembly of Belarus. And he's also chairman of the board of the Center for Foreign Policy and Security Studies in Belarus. Thank you very much, Andre, for finding time in this busy period to uh, join us. Also, I welcome Dr. Elena Kuzmina. Elena, as we have learned, is partially on vacation. Please receive our words of gratitude for finding uh, time to join us. She's the head of a section for Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine of the uh, National Research Institute for, of World Economy and International Relations from Russia. Moving on, Mr. Tony van der Tocht. Tony has joined us from the Netherlands. Tony is a senior research fellow of Cleaning Dell. Netherlands Institute of International Relations, and he's one of the most active experts in the EU who is writing and commenting on what is happening in the European Russian relations and generally speaking in Eurasia. And that's why it's our honor. Tony, thank you very much for joining our discussion today. And uh, the fourth speaker here is Mr. Thomas Helm. He is the director for, uh, of the country office in Kazakhstan from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. He represents Germany here in this discussion, but as I can see, Thomas has yet to join us, and uh, hopefully within the next few minutes he will do just that. Now we're going to follow the standard procedure for all our episodes in the series, and we'll start with very laconic, brief digests of presentations on the publications prepared on the strategic um, challenges faced by the Eurasian Economic Union. One of these publications was prepared by Andrei Rusakovich, and second one prepared by Thomas Helm. I will ask those people who would like to 
uh, read more in detail of these publications to go to the web page of the Minsk Dialogue where you can read the full text. Now, Andre, without further ado, I'm turning the mic to you and you're welcome to start. Sorry for interrupting. It's just that Thomas is writing to me. He says he is having problems in uh, getting connection to the conference. Okay, then we'll uh, solve this with our assistance but we're not going to make it hinder our for the presentation. We'll move to the Andrei Rusakovich presentation. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I hope you can hear me well. Evgeny, give me a high sign if something is wrong with the connection. I'm happy to see all the participants who once again allow me to uh, welcome you during this difficult period of time, see that all of you are healthy and well. And most importantly, that you're a specialist who continue to uh, shape up an objective view on the Eurasian Economic Union and the global processes in general. Dear colleagues, I will say just a few brief theses on this, considering the five minute resource that I have. Number one, the general view on the Eurasian Economic Union. We need to note that this project has been moving forward uh, for quite a while already in different uh, formats, of course, starting from the Customs Union of 1995, then Eurasian Economic Community of the early 2000s and now as of January 1st. On January 1st, next year, we're going to celebrate the sixth anniversary of the new formation of the, of the new title and name of the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, the ground for the Eurasian Economic Union has been put in place and many processes that were perceived as early as 25 years ago were announced as the principal processes are not completed yet. The customs union is working with certain problems too, both internal market and external market. I'm moving to the problems right away now because the Achievements, of course, can be uh, declared as important, of course, but it's all uh, comparable. For instance, some things like single markets of oil and gas were planned to create until the year 2025, but the practice shows that aside from the, those things that are observed on the internal national markets, these processes are moving ahead quite slowly. There are problems related to the disbalance of economies, structure of economies of member states of Eurasian Economic Union. The main subject matter of this discussion is about the supranational powers of the Institute of the Eurasian Economic Union and others. So generally speaking, the problems do exist and continue to exist. And most importantly, they are not critical for the integration trend in general. Second thing, of course, we're talking about the Belarusian chairmanship. As you know, Belarus is now chairing the structures of the Eurasian Economic Union this year. And it was declared in January, uh, Belarus declared quite an ambitious agenda of our chairmanship. Uh, we were addressing a number of tasks about the single and general policies, as was announced many times already, and uh, shaping up the single uh, financial energy market and uh, equalizing the conditions for economic activities, social policies, and other important things. Uh, the priority task for the Russian government was full lifting of barriers and maximum uh, reduction of uh, exceptions from the markets of Eurasian Economic Union and uh, prevention of any other forms of barriers. Of course, the uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic has introduced its own corrections. It turned out that the Eurasian Economic Union, just like the other international associations or institutions, proved to be unprepared for these kinds of challenges. And the Eurasian Economic Union has shown the prevalence of country-based policies uh, to respond to the pandemic challenges, which were weakly at best coordinated at the uh, international level, which showed different approaches in different countries, like uh, Russia showed one scenario, Belarus uh, 
stuck to a different scenario. That is why naturally the borders were locked down, the general people's mobility shrunk, uh, companies shut down, which had delivered a lethal blow on both countries and the Eurasian Economic Union. On the parallel, a new node of problems happened related to the reduction of oil prices. Uh, OPEC plus failed to reach an agreement, reduction on the oil consumption, which uh, infringed on the economic interests of most of the um, member states of the Eurasian Economic Union. First of all, Russia, reformatting of employment, and again, reduction of the general living standards, changing of uh, people's mentality under the influence of pandemic. These are all new challenges for the elites of member states. And most important thing I need to note here is that generally speaking, the elites of the member states of EAEU see the overcoming of this uh, challenges only at the supranational level. So speaking at the level of the institutions of the union, we saw the total deficit of real actions to prevent or re respond to the pandemic, but here we have to be realistic. We saw that in April, that uh, first was a political declaration made by many countries, and most importantly, the declaration also reconfirmed the readiness to do the joint work to remove negative consequences of pandemic. And uh, a package of measures was approved, directed at preservation of macroeconomic stability and ensuring the uh, uh, viable needs of population and to maintain the mutual trade and movement of goods. In fact, this declaration was of positive nature, parallel to the different decisions on simplification of access to the markets of those goods which were related to overcoming of the pandemic, mostly medical goods. On parallel with that, there, and there is another thing worth mentioning. Of course, pandemic coincided with two political events first in Russia, and there is a constitutional referendum or referendum on uh, amendments to the constitution in Belarus, it's presidential elections, and naturally uh, some of the agenda of the EAEU is hidden under this. But I must say that the leaders of the Eurasian Economic Union member states have undertaken an important step. First of all, approval of strategic policies for the development of integration of this union in the next for the next five year period. This way, they have shaped up quite a clear political message, policy statement, if you will, which reconfirmed their commitment to the main principles of the Eurasian integration. In principle, I must note here yet another important thing, which is important for Belarus and Russia, which is combination or correlation of the Eurasian Economic Union and its development with other integration projects of the post-Soviet zone. First of all, we're talking about here the further development of the union state of Russia and Belarus. Naturally, the discussion of 2019 have revealed significant difficulties which can also affect the position of both Belarus and Russia within the Eurasian Economic Union. But naturally, here we need to uh, speak about this project differently. Whatever can be done uh, separately within the union, maybe should not be repeated within the union state parameters. And the discussion on the union state is going to be continued, I guess. And the union state, this project is going to be viewed as a laboratory of integration on a post-Soviet zone. Still open are the questions of the expansion of the Eurasian Economic Union. We know about the decision of Uzbekistan of the possibility of getting a status of a, an observer state. We see that the union continues to, to do active work on the external market by building a system of relations with other international institutions and state. We're discussing a uh, creation of zones of free, tr free trade zones and some projects as well. That is why considering the post uh, COVID-19 world, as it is expected, is going to be more 
rigid, more forceful, there will be less resource, more resource deficient, both financial and uh, natural, and there will be fiercer com competition, also technological competition. Naturally, the countries of the region will see a way out of this crisis through the activization of the integration process, integration projects. And this way, the future of the union is much more optimistic. Another question is that the member states of the union will have to fiercely compete on the external markets. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Thank you for this balance start that you started with the problems ended with the optimistic view. Thomas, hello. I see that you've joined us. You've joined our discussion. Don't forget to use your microphone now. And after that, I'm glad to pass this virtual microphone to you so that you can view your ideas about this publication. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, sorry for uh, joining a little bit late. I'm at the moment in a hotel in um, Almaty. And uh, first, the internet connection was not so good. I hope that you can understand me uh, properly um, because um, um, I had difficulties with um, um, to understand uh, completely Mr. Ozakovic because from time to time he was frozen and uh, interrupted uh, and, and the speech was even interrupted, I hope. And I had uh, some fights to, to stand with my Dell computer. I love Dell, I must say. It's uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> when Dell bought good computers, Amazon was still a bookstore and not more. Yeah. So, but we still buy them. Anyway. So, um, I uh, delivered a paper and I would like to give some comments uh, on the pandemic situation um, just in a few minutes. Um, you know, from my point of view, still the Eurasian Economic Union is still a torso, to be, to be honest. It is, a, it is a, um, a fragment because it was an idea in the 90s, from the 90s, end of the 90s, it was the first uh, idea about an Eurasian Economic Union was made by Nazarbayev. Um, Kazakhstan was a poor country at that time. Uh, it was before the oil boom. It was end of the 90s uh, of the last uh, century, 1989, nine, uh, 1998, 1999. And then uh, the, uh, the idea of the Eurasian Economic Union was a little bit forgotten. And it came up again after the occupation uh, by uh, Russia and, uh, and the sanctions which followed from uh, from uh, from Europe and uh, and uh, the West, and uh, so it was a little bit um, uh, how to stay in the market at that time and how to sell products, and so uh, it was a little bit in a rush. Finished then. Uh, it was signed in 2014 um, when um, um, and came into effect in January 2015, and it is what it is. It is a customs union mostly. Uh, and so in this pandemic, uh, pandemic crisis, there are a lot of tools just missing, tools uh, which uh, the, uni uh, the European Union have to, to, um, uh, to, to and has to, to um, help the, the countries, the member states, you, you see the outcome of these really challenging uh, 90 hours uh, negotiations which ended this week uh, about uh, the restructuring program of Europe um, with a budget from the European Union and with a budget from the member states, uh, the credits, the, sub, uh, the subsidies uh, which are handed out. Um, uh, the, the, the Eurasian Economic Union has not a toolbox like this. And that is, of course, a bitter, a bitter missing. And it's not in the construction. It is a, mostly a, a customs union and a political project, but not. it's not a um, political economy union as it should be or as it could be. So um, uh, under the pandemic crisis, uh, the data of today are Russia 790,000 uh, infected people, um, Kazakhstan 75,000, Belarus 70, uh, 67,000, Armenia 36,000 and Kyrgyzstan nearly 30,000. When you combine it with other regions, I would say in one sentence, we do not cover ourselves with glory, I wouldn't say, yeah, uh, this, uh, this way. So there are a lot of uh, regions uh, which are doing better on this. 
And um, what you can see is that the Eurasian Economic Union is doing everything individually. There's no common strategy. Every uh, country uh, acts differently. Um, for example, um, uh, when they start uh, in the process of fighting Corona, Belarus was very late, you know. Um, um, you know about these videos, the president said in this ice stadium, yeah, I, can, I couldn't see any virus. Um, um, Russia even started late with it um, uh, and with the lockdowns compared with, uh, with, um, um, with uh, countries in the European Union. Uh, Armenia uh, still uh, fly, flew to, to Iran and to northern Italy. Uh, while other while other uh, countries uh, uh, took lockdown measures, and Kazakhstan, um, they started uh, when the first cases approached in Kazakhstan and did a lockdown, but they opened up very very suddenly and uh, not step by step as uh, countries uh, in the European Union did it. They 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 closed very fast and they opened very fast, and uh, and so. Um, they get a they get a hit back uh, uh, um, in that in that crisis. Um, so um, uh, the, at the moment, the programs um, are quite uh, um, to fight the uh, the corona crisis and even um, uh, the economy problems, which are connected with them. They are quite they are quite different. There are. Not direct, no direct manner, uh, measures done in uh, in Belarus, for example. There is um, uh, a lot of um, uh, some measures done in Kazakhstan, but um, they are um, not comprehensive, to be honest. Uh, people, for example, who lose their jobs got uh, forty two thousand five hundred tenger, which is at the moment less than one hundred euros uh, per month. They get it twice. Uh, when the lockdown um, uh, lasted a little bit longer, but um, that is um, what we call a little bit a hot dro a dro a drop of water on a hot stone uh, for for people who, who lost their jobs or something like this. And there is no different uh, differencing uh, in this. Is you get the same amount of money either if you live in Almaty or if you live in a, uh, in a, in the in the landscapes and to live from. 42,000 ten in Almaty, that's, uh, that's, um, that's nearly Im impossible. We have, of course, they, uh, they uh, um, um, did cat, uh, cut, uh, cat, um, tax cuts for, um, uh, for companies. Uh, they, um, uh, they, they saved their air, um, their air uh, carriers. Um, that is what all, countries, what all countries did. But all in all, to sum it up for the first round, um, it is like this, that uh, the measures are not coordinated in the Eurasian Economic Union. Everybody is doing um, or following their own strategy. Um, for example, uh, um, just mentioning Belarus, Belarus uh, didn't close the border to Russia, but Russia closed the border to Belarus. Yeah? And so, so um, uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's uh, it's uh, different strategies, different attempts, but from my point of view, no um, uh, coordinated uh, fight in this um, Eurasian Economic Union uh, and no comprehensive strategy toward uh, or, uh, or to with COVID-19. So that is what I would, would like to mention at the start. I wrote it in that paper, I, maybe you read it, and so I think that should be the beginning for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. And without further ado, now we're going to move to the comments that will be made by two other speakers. I uh, just decide to start with uh, Dr. Elena Kuzmina. Please, uh, can you provide your feedback to the, those uh, publications and the key thesis that were just voiced here? I largely agree with the colleagues here. I would simply focus on, two, on a number of other things. First of all, in principle, if we view the EU, each country also made their own individual decision on the COVID-19 prevention measures and, the, and it was not EU that shut down initially, but uh, individual countries, each national government made the decision. For the all other countries of the world, it was an unexpected 
crisis and a uh, relatively unpredictable situation in terms of the time at least, how long it will take. And uh, it's comment number one. Second comment is that the Eurasian, uh, Eurasian Economic Union, despite the fact that uh, the attempts of the establishment of such a union cover the period uh, ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, almost at, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in reality, the Eurasian Economic Union has been working much for much shorter period of time, of course. And uh, indeed, we don't have such tools or like we don't have common or shared budget, which would be conducive to the development of or establishment of different programs for anti-crisis programs for Eurasian Economic Union in general. What our colleague from Almaty said, we have Eurasian Development Bank and the special Eurasian fund which handles such issues. But first of all, the Eurasian Development Bank has somewhat different mandate, which is not linked to the actual Eurasian Economic Union. They have their own programs. Indeed, the Eurasian Economic Union so far is following the path that it's following. But if we look at what has been done in the past, even if, even if we look at the statistics, it became evident right away the Eurasian Economic Commission uh, provides statistics for the five first months from January to May. What happened and what is clearly perceived from the statistics is that by May, the GDP of those countries, of all countries, have not reduced as much as it could have been reduced. Of course, it will go down further and the ultimate results will be learned later on. But if we look at the concrete things and concrete economic sectors in all the countries, the biggest dropout drop was shown or slump was shown by the industries. With the exception of Kyrgyzstan, agriculture is growing quite well, which also provides its positive result not only to GDP, but it might also have deliver a positive result for future development of those countries. Naturally, there was a slump in uh, transportation sector, both public, be it passenger transportation or goods transportation. Goods transportation uh, remained at the same level only in Belarus. In Belarus, Belarus showed a bit more than uh, about the same or even a bit higher percentage than vis-a-vis uh, -vis previous year. If we look at the trade sector, again, to a certain extent, owing to the emergency measure, measures adopted, because here we were talking about not only about medicines and medical equipment, mostly we were talking about foodstuffs and uh, some types of industrial products. If we look at the documents of the Eurasian Economic Union, whatever, products were given green line for transportation. Right away, we see an explosive growth there. I think it was the document adopted on April 4th. So the decision was made quite quickly within the Eurasian Economic Union. And yet another trend that we perceived is that trade with the third countries have, has dropped significantly with four countries, much stronger than the mutual trade between the countries. Mutual trade is also going down, but it, was, it went down by 2-3%, 4% maybe, maximum. Whereas uh, trade with third countries like with China, European Union, the main trading partners of the Eurasian Economic Union, it went down by 15-20%. to 20%. This is, These are the data from April-May. And as a result, again, it will, of course, play a serious role later on. And yet another trend that was mentioned in Thomas's uh, presentation, but he did mention it about the unemployment. Unemployment indeed has grown considerably, but it has grown mostly because of the Russian Federation. If we look at other countries, the four countries out of five, they don't have such data by April, uh, they, they don't have data for May. So the unemployment rate didn't grow compared to the previous period, uh, same period of the previous year. But in Russia, the unemployment has grown considerably. You know that Russia undertakes 
quite serious social measures to um, contract it. And uh, these measures are mentioned in the Thomas's report as well. And uh, additionally, now the President Putin is preparing a decree on how they're going to continue with the social measures until 2030. These are the strategic uh, policies for Russia where four out of six bullet points are about this social protection and social support. It is indeed a very difficult thing because they, uh, it goes without saying that there is a hidden or concealed unemployment. Now we have a considerable number of people who are working half time. This is also a form of concealed or hidden unemployment that will turn out into a serious problem for the Eurasian Economic Union. Yes, indeed, we have big problems, or rather, we have problems with oil and the profitability, not only for uh, Russia, but also Kazakhstan and Belarus, because of the drop of the oil prices. And there was a serious drop in uh, metal prices as well. People uh, sometimes neglect that. Uh, for Russia and Kazakhstan, a uh, drop in metal prices is also a serious uh, blow. Uh, but as far as the rare earth metal and uh, uh, like precious metals, uh, gold, platinum, uranium, and that's what uh, our country is rich in, at least three countries out of five in the world are in the Eurasian Economic Union that creates additional opportunities for our Eurasian Economic Union countries because the prices for these precious metals have grown. So that will be the end of my comment. We'll have a subsequent discussion. I have a, a number of other comments to add, but so far so good. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. And I'm giving the floor now to Tony van der Tocht to also provide comments to what was mentioned by Andre and Thomas. Tony, uh, we are passing the microphone to The Hague now, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Johanny and Jakob, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, uh, very important project, I think, uh, when you are discussing the longer term effects of this whole uh, pandemic, which is, well, basically not over yet, but it's good to start thinking already now about the longer term consequences. Um, I have a few points to make after having read both papers and listened to the comments of the colleagues. Um, first, that um, um, when we look at the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union and how they reacted to the pandemic, I see a few uh, similarities and a few differences. Um, the similarities in that, well, both organizations were un un totally unprepared for such a crisis. Um, and uh, for both, um, the reaction was at first uh, on the level of the national states, uh, also for the EU, uh, because health matters are mainly in the competence of the member states and not in the competence of the European Commission. So it's only logical that in such a situation, the initial reaction uh, would be on a national basis, uh, including taking measures such as the closure of borders, uh, and other measures to prevent the spread of the pandemic. Um, but where there is a fundamental difference is, um, and I think that is because the European Union is much more integrated than the Eurasian Economic Union as a project, um, is that gradually the European Union is now getting its act together, uh, both in having a more coordinated approach um, towards the pandemic and the effects, the immediate effects uh, in healthcare of the pandemic, but also in tackling with the economic and social consequences uh, for the longer term. And we have seen both the actions of the European Central Bank and we have seen the whole packages which have been agreed by this um, uh, very long summit meeting which took place over the weekend. Uh, we have see, seen some measures which the EU has taken uh, to reach out to partners, including on the Western Balkans, Eastern Partnership countries, to support them in dealing with the uh, mainly the economic consequences of the pandemia, sometimes also um, providing uh, medical equipment to deal with the immediate health effects. Um, 
and this is the well this is now this is a, a, a difference um, and I think um, when you look at um, the longer term effects um, and look at what what the effects would be on integration processes um, then I, I I'm a little bit more uh, doubtful about whether this will increase uh, let's say integration within the Eurasian Economic Union um, because even in the EU um, what we are seeing we are looking at the longer term effects of um, on value change on production chains and we are discussing this also um, as a way to well that we have to um, provide Europe the European Union with a certain strategic autonomy that we should if we are facing another crisis uh, that we should not be uh, as vulnerable as we were um, in for example health matters uh, so uh, in a way the European Union is also becoming a bit more protectionist I think uh, looking at okay uh, this is very nice um, these very big value change and production change but in some strategic areas we may have to reduce our vulnerabilities and whether that is going to be done by well building up strategic stocks which is very expensive uh, so to have all these month this this mouth masks and and medical equipment already available for the next crisis or whether this will um, be by well stimulating local production so production within the european union so that we do not depend on these long lines of uh, um, uh, production and transport from outside of the european union china or, or otherwise so this is going to be the discussion, I think, uh, now, whether we have to concentrate more on local production in some areas. Uh, of course, we are all, uh, well, uh, very open and trading countries, uh, well, the Netherlands in particular, um, or uh, whether we should at least have some, some handbrakes, uh, some measures to, to make ourselves less vulnerable and, and more autonomous uh, on the... Um, uh, when facing um, uh, other crises, broader broader crises. Um, this also brings me on, let's say, the more geopolitical context, um, because we are not only looking at the EU, we're not only looking at Eurasian Economic Union. Um, I think the, the COVID crisis has um, uh, provided us with a, a very clear picture of an increase in this whole conflict between the U.S. and China, and um, as, so we have to think about not only what the rise of China means for us, for both of us, actually, uh, with this whole Belt and Road Initiative. What is the effect of COVID uh, on this? Uh, does it strengthen the position of China, or does it ultimately weaken the position of China in the longer term? We don't know. I mean, the jury there is out. China will also have to cope internally with still a lot of consequences of the COVID crisis. Um, but also in the EU, and I suppose also in the Eurasian Economic Union, what we are looking at is how do we position ourselves between the US and China? This conflict has sharpened, especially the trade conflicts, um, uh, as a consequence of also this whole COVID crisis. Um, but there is more at stake than purely a trade conflict. Uh, I mean, this is also about the technical norms and standards of the future, uh, especially in the digital sphere, when we are discussing 5G. So who is going to set the standards? And um, well, Europe may be, uh, let's say, militarily weak, uh, but it's a huge market. And um, we are a standard setter in uh, a lot of areas. Um, so, in uh, when discussing, when looking at the longer term, um, what the EU is, is, is trying to do is to looking more critically um, at its relationship with China. We want to have connectivity. We don't want to be decoupled like uh, some in the US are um, arguing. Um, we have discussions uh, with China, very difficult discussions, but uh, still on uh, connectivity. 
um, on the European norms and standards, which uh, for a large part are also adopted within the Eurasian Economic Union as stand technical norms and standards. Um, and while discussing that with China, we, we are also thinking about, and that's, that's my personal opinion, which I'm, I'm already for a long time a, a proponent of um, having broader discussions between the European Commission and the Eurasian Economic Commission, um, especially about these technical norms and standards. And I think we could be partners also in discussing together such norms and standards, especially in new spheres like the digital uh, with China. Uh, not to, let's say, to have a, a, a common front, anti-Chinese front, but to, to discuss these things together, because we see some traction also in the discussion between EU and China in this respect. So it's, I mean, it's not totally hopeless. It's not that the Chinese are uh, providing us either with their standards or our standards. So there is some way where we can both constructively engage. Um, and whether it is possible also to do it with the US, well, at the, with the present administration, I don't see very many options, uh, but who knows uh, who will become uh, the next president. Uh, and maybe afterwards, I don't think, I mean, the US would like to uh, patch up uh, this whole crisis with China, but um, a new administration in Washington could provide more opportunities for us to, uh, to discuss as allies how to tackle China and how, how to deal with, with the challenge which China is posing to basically to all of us, also to, to the Eurasian Economic Union, to Russia. Um, and it is, it is very clear why um, Eurasian Economic Union is still rather protectionist also in its relations with China, uh, since you also don't want uh, China to completely take over your markets. Uh, so I think if you want to stimulate competitiveness um, also within uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, at a certain time you would have to reach out more to global markets. Uh, and I think there are opportunities there to link up with also with European partners, uh, partners from inside the EU, um, and not necessarily be confronted with binary choices, either the US or China or, or, or only China. Uh, as a real option uh, for for your companies and for your um, uh, for the, the the your own process of integration. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, uh, so I'm I'm maybe a little bit less uh, pes uh, le less optimistic than than Andrei Rusakovich, but uh, I still I see some also some some silver lining uh, of the, on this whole crisis, and uh, we can discuss this further in the debate. Thank you, Tony. I would like to right away remind everybody who is listening and viewing us here in Zoom and at Facebook that we welcome any types of questions, so please send them in. And now I have a number of questions from my side. This project that we're running in uh, Russian is called Corona Crisis, in, uh, in English is called The World Handcuffed, is focused on the strategic challenges and uh, strategic issues related to, in this case, to the Eurasian Economic Union in the context of the pandemic. So in that respect, I have a number of questions. It is no secret for anybody, and I will put a point on this, that last year and the early 2020, inside the Eurasian Economic Union, there was quite a hot discussion, which sometimes manifested itself in the hot exchanges between the heads of states. And if I'm not mistaken, the first meeting or the summit in this format, in the format of the Eurasian Economic Union, which was organized in the online format this year, has demonstrated quite a serious contradictions between the heads of states. And uh, I will remind you of the quite popular statement or consideration that was shared by some Russian expert community that Moscow should think twice about whether it makes sense to continue with these difficult discussions within the Eurasian Economic Union, or maybe should they put their stakes on the Eurasian Economic Union for the strategic development, or instead, rather, they should give a much more modest room for the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, like CIS, for instance, Commonwealth of Independent States, uh, but still move them aside or put them on sidelines and instead concentrate on other development priorities in Russia. 
I would like to hear the opinion from Yelena Kuzmina about this. Uh, what do you think, uh, this, based on the situation that developed in the past few months, uh, those things relate to pandemic in the field of economy, social standards, are they changing somehow this discussion among expert community? Because it's quite justified, and Andre mentioned this as well, that uh, last statements and the most recent documents that we have from the Eurasian Economic Union, they sound more optimistic than before. So how do you view it from Moscow, whether you have pessimistic or optimistic view on this? Don't, you forgot to switch on your microphone. Sorry. I don't think, I will give you a more realistic instead of pessimistic or optimistic view. Uh, based on what the heads of states have declared during the summit of the Eurasian Economic Union that took place in um, cyberspace. In principle, they didn't say anything new. They didn't say anything new vis-a-vis -vis what, what they said in the past. At least that's what I heard, that so far the political union, and as long as it's political, then to a certain extent, ideologically and informationally, this union, that what was Kazakhstan said, that we shouldn't go beyond this economic union. So we have questions about energy sector, also questions, these questions were discussed and it became clear right away that they cannot be solved in the foreseeable future, not only from the side of Russia, because Kazakhstan, for instance, fully supported Russia here because there are some contracts signed much earlier than the Eurasian Economic Union was born. And uh, it was agreed that a single energy market will be established for both power and energy resources. These uh, questions are being discussed, solutions are being found, and uh, if we look at it, the program which was not signed was based, 90, it was approved by 95%, that's what our leader said, and most of the questions there have been decided on, that this development will move on. Now, about the COVID-19 pandemic effects, of course, there is a real understanding in Moscow that a huge influence will be exercised by this uh, China American conflict, and I fully agree with Tony on this. And here, we can say that we need to find a balance, not only between these two superpowers, but the, the super economies, if you will, but also we need to find a balance to make sure that these countries, to make sure that we uh, follow our own interests, economic interests of the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, the national economy's interests within the EAEU. In principle, again, there is nothing new here because the agreement with China, for instance, signed, uh, was signed and ratified by the Eurasian Economic Union last year. And uh, the text of this agreement is on about non-tariff. First of all, it's uh, much broader. It's not related only to trade, and uh, they're not talking about any free trade zone there, but just about the trade rules. Thirdly, I think it is number three, right? Uh, that uh, Russia, if we look at, at the foreign economic strategy of Russia, it becomes clear that for us, of huge importance is how we build relations with the Eurasian region, and Eurasian Union is the basis that we build on in Russia. We're not saying that we're building only Eurasian Union, that we are communicating only within the Eurasian Union. We can mention different formats, big Eurasia and uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok, you can call it different formats, but 
in principle, it is quite a serious thing. And here we're not only talking about China and uh, Southeastern Asia, but also India can be included. And as long as for Russia, BRICS and RIC are important components and uh, for political and economic life, that is why indeed perhaps another relatively new aspect for russia is that in the past six months the covid 19 situation has highlighted the importance of domestic policies of countries first of all social policies socioeconomic policies at the national level. We're not only talking about the measures undertaken by Russia at the national level. I'm saying I'm talking about the measures both about overcoming the COVID-19 situation from the medical point of view and from the economic point of view, but also broader format of measures. When we look at when we start to build the road, that we failed to reach an agreement. They, I'm talking about the high-speed train road to Kazan and further on to Yekaterinburg. And as far as I understand, in future, it will move on and uh, reach out to Belarus and further to Europe. I understand that we start to promote the formats which need to develop the situation inside Russia. I understand that huge funds are required for that and huge funds are required for Russia to maintain the Russian economy. Huge funds are required for the Eurasian Economic Union to develop because the investments, external investments into EU and Russian Federation are going to be reduced considerably because of the global situation, because of the COVID-19 and uh, I understand that the World Bank has calculated that there will be huge cut down on the FDIs all over the world and it will invariably affect us. And the question only, only will be how to develop, where to find the sources for development and where to find the investments. And investments will have to be sourced from inside. And it's for a reason that in all our most recent programs, the one which was adopted on April 10th and the one which is expected to be adopted in September and of the documents that are already visible. Here we're talking about the de development of uh, own development institutions, that is internal investments. How to make it happen, that's a question. Of course, there will be many questions and um, I personally believe that Russia is not reneging on a single of its projects, neither on its Eurasian Economic Union, not our big greater Eurasia, I'm talking about uh, China, Eurasian Economic Union, cooperation format. And uh, naturally, considering the current financial and economic situation, there will be some corrections, depending on whether there will be a second wave of COVID-19 both in Russia and globally, how quickly the borders will be open or how quickly possibly it will be possible to move around the world, even within the Eurasian Economic Union, because at the moment, the internal borders of the Eurasian Economic Union are still closed down because of the health situation. The only movement we can see is happening within uh, uh, between in uh, connectivity between Russia and Belarus. This is the really, in effect, open borders. But as far as other Eurasian Economic Union countries are concerned, the borders are closed and they keep prolonging this uh, border lockdown. And in some cases, they, the anti COVID measures becoming even more strict. Of course, some corrections will be introduced. The corrections are. Uh, stipulated by the Eurasian Economic Union documents already. You can find them in the Eurasian Economic Union documents. I don't think there will be any more 
dramatic changes and uh, whatever is predetermined within b b Russia by its uh, by our internal documents it is confirmed by our documents and conf if you listen to uh, watched a speech of our prime minister in Russian Duma. He also made some policy statements there. And at least for the midterm future, a few years ahead, we have more or less clear picture of what is going to happen. Again, largely it will depend on uh, whether there will be or will not be a second wave of the COVID-19. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's clear that uh, there are a lot of uncertainties, to put it mildly. I see that Thomas also would like to provide his feedback on this question and uh, share his view from Kazakhstan, right? We mentioned Kazakhstan a number of times now. You have the floor. Yeah, that was a little bit different when I mentioned uh, that I would like to elaborate. It was um, that I um, would like to um, elaborate a little bit on uh, Tony's um, uh, uh, thesis because uh, every, everybody is interested and of course Kazakhstan is connected with it. What happens, what happens with China in this situation? And I'm, I totally agree. Uh, what he said that um, it's not known so far if uh, China will be strengthened or weakened uh, in uh, in this COVID situation that comes out of it. But I think it's absolutely clear what China has in mind and that they that they think that they are the winner of this game and that uh, COVID nineteen can be a game changer for them. Uh, just let me uh, tell you five examples of this. The first. The first time that it ever happened in 30, nearly 30 years of the existence of the Republic of Kazakhstan is that the ambassador of China was asked, strongly asked to, to come to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because there were some um, um, uh, articles published in China that Kazakhstan, that parts of Kazakhstan belong to China and that uh, Kazakh people would love to be uh, um, under the Chinese government in this corona crisis. First, second. Um, I had a little dispute with one of our team leaders uh, who used to be in Hong Kong before. He's a good friend of mine, but we have different opinions about what happens to the guys in Hong Kong when it takes place. And I, saw, uh, I said last year when there was a rallies in Hong Kong, that the Chinese wait for the last uh, for the right moment and will get and catch all these guys uh, who uh, organized the rallies. And now it's a time. You see the security law, what happened in Hong Kong, and the only recommendation I can give to the guys who organized the rallies: leave Hong Kong as as soon as possible. That is the only thing what I can tell them. The next, what we find is meanwhile we find military mili military ships in the South China Sea who chase. Um, uh, boats from Philippines and others. We hear, hear about overflights for military planes over Taiwan. Uh, that is number four. And number five is, um, uh, is uh, even in this week, we found now that they, um, um, that they uh, set uh, the whole Xinjiang region, which is under the watch, uh, in an emergency status. Um, it's every day a new taboo what we find now. And I think China is testing its strengths and they test out how far they can go. And, uh, um, and I think they are the winner of the day. That is what they think. We will see if we will be able uh, to uh, set a stop sign uh, and say, that is how far you go and you don't go any step further. That is what we... Uh, uh, what is interesting uh, for me to find out in the next weeks and months. Um, Kazakhstan is mentioned a couple of times, yes. Um, uh, I would also uh, give an answer to um, uh, Elena in this moment. Um, I think I'm fighting now five years in Kazakhstan to find out what is the unemployment rate in Kazakhstan. Um, uh, I didn't manage it so far because we have a very, very huge unregistered, unregistered uh, unemployment. Um, 
You see, um, getting unemployed in Kazakhstan means um, an awful amount of paperwork for <clears throat> a little money. And so a lot of people stay just unregistered. And so they do not fall under the unemployment rate. As they tell you for years now, it's 5%, 5%, 5% unemployment rate. But besides the ordinary unemployment, we have a lot of people, what we called self-employment. Self-employment means they work somewhere on the bazaars for a little amount of hand money, and that's it. But they do not fall under the statistics of unemployment. And that is even the case um, uh, in this situation now, um, where a lot of people are de facto unemployed, but not registered at unemployed. Thank you, Thomas. I see that uh, there are some experts among participants from China. So if they want to, they might also voice their position on what has been said. But I would like to address Andrei Rusakovich now. If you want to, you can add something to what has been said about this discussion of strategic prospects of EAEU and its member states because of the growing confrontation between the United States and China. It is obvious that for Belarus, despite the uh, geographical remoteness from China, it is, still remains to be a very relevant issue. Also, I would like to return to the question that I asked Yelena about the balance of negative and positive things. You, Andre, also spoke about this balance and in your publication. But again, if we try to somehow summarize it and look at most recent agreements uh, achieved here in Minsk, how high is the danger I would have uh, rather focused on the Russian position because in your uh, publication, you call Russia a locomotive of integration. Nobody has doubt about that. How high is the threat that this call uh, from the expert community of Russia that let us uh, switch off uh, from the Eurasian Economic Union development uh, rather neglected and sideline it uh, by putting extra focus on internal policy discussions? Andre, you have the floor. Thank you. Within the context of what has been said, I'd like to note one important thing. In fact, both Belarus and Russia, as members of the Eurasian Economic Union at the moment, are starting to Uh, starting a new stage in their development. Uh, Belarus is on the verge of uh, presidential elections and uh, anyway, the new governments of new countries are shaping up, first of all, the national policies for economic development. And the greater emphasis here is put on the development of drivers of their economic growth. For instance, Belarus at the moment continues with its uh, strong position with the agriculture. We have the head of our state has declared that agriculture will be one of the staples of our economy. IT technologies is another focus. New productions are going to be opened in Russia. Judging from the speech of the new prime minister at the parliament, they also have spoken about ambitious goals. Another thing is how these new programs, country programs are going to be connected with the development and the future problems of the, discussed at the level of the Eurasian Economic Union. Of course, it would be great if there's 100% connectivity between them, but it's just wishful thinking. It's unlikely to happen. The trend which is observed now in the Eurasian Economic Union, if we take mid 90s, for instance, was about the following, gradual development with the overall domination of country problems at the country level. And uh, nobody's going to abandon it anytime soon. Second question is about the Russian approaches. 
I would agree with uh, Yelena Kuzmina's assessment. Russia is capable of solving all its political and economic questions on the post-Soviet zone single-handedly. But uh, the neighborhood belt and the neighborhood of Union countries around is, uh, Russia is important for it. It's uh, politically, all the integration projects, I'm talking about the Union state or the five state Union, a possible expansion through the Eurasian Economic Union and CIS, uh, the big Eurasia, they will continue to exist. Another thing is that how much resources will be allocated for that? How much resources will be given to different states? First of all, how much resources will be made available by Russia for such integration processes? It's one, it's one of the biggest questions on our agenda. As for the quite interesting discussion about China and China's place in uh, Eurasian development strategy here, there will be always a double entendre strategy, uh, both from the Eurasian Economic Union and the member states. On the one hand, and they will continue to deepen their cooperation and implement investment projects, ever more so that China insists on them, and they offer these projects to the region. Another thing is that there will be clearly protectionist spirit directed at meeting one's positions. For Belarus and its relations with China, there is one big problem, one big disadvantage, one big uh, negative balance in our trade with China. Deficit, uh, trade deficit, and it's hard to rectify. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andre. Here we start to receive questions from Artyom Nazarenko, also uh, from Belarusian State University, and the colleague of Andrei Rusakovich. Unfortunately, we don't have anybody who could uh, represent the Eurasian Economic Union Institute or government structures from member states. It is about the prospects of creating single standards in infrastructure of digital economy in, at the Eurasian Economic Union level. Can it be done uh, in coordination with others? I don't know whether our speakers are following this topic. If whoever is prepared to answer this question, you're welcome to do so. I can partially answer this question indeed. If we rely on the documents which are already adopted by the Eurasian Economic Union, in the most recent documents, if we look at them, it was mentioned that we have made the biggest progress in trade issues and that we're more of a customs union. And indeed many things also in digital economy, for instance, and uh, in digital standards, not only digital economy, but rather digital standards to a larger extent are described within various trade agreements. First of all, we're talking about establishment of standards from the logistical point of view, digital signature, customs relations. I can even read out an excerpt from the document signed on April 10th, creation of enabling environment for digital trade through expansion of, of digital documents and digitization of conductivity of logistical operators. Again, application of technologies for registration for import export goods. And here we're talking about digital signature, first of all, and cooperation once again in the customs sector, but we're not only talking about trade here. As long as it is developed to a greater extent, logically enough, they speak about this. It's the, here we have much better interaction, but now it became more self-evident that some sectors 
which are more promising in the post-COVID period, who have improved their situation in the post-COVID-19 period. These are IT technology sectors. Some forms of high precision production lines, which are also related to the development of this sector. That's what I can say. It's clear that we cannot speak on behalf of many other things because some things are simply not uh, solved at the supranational level. And there are many things which cannot be decided at the supranational level, considering the level of integration. And some things are simply neglected by our countries. Although each one of the countries of the Eurasian Economic Union declares that this sector is developing and should be developed on the priority basis. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Before going to the second part of Artyom's question, I would like to ask a somewhat different question to Tony. Tony, once again, you mentioned that you often speak in favor of the dialogue between uh, EU and Eurasian Economic Union. And uh, in the past few years, you wrote a number of publications about this. But at the same time, we see that, first of all, from the European Union, especially from some of the states of member states of the European Union, there is a total rejection or denial to accept this idea. In the past few months, for sure, European Union uh, didn't have time to even consider such a pot potential for cooperation with the Eurasian Economic Union. But still, do you think that, that such crisis situation can become a serious boost to urge and move these two institutions uh, to the dialogue table? Because EU, under the press pressure of these emergency problems, and maybe considering also the discussion, which I think was starting last year, remember at the uh, Minsk Dialogue Forum, one of the most active promoters was Mr. Schneider, who spoke about some of similar discussions in Brussels, where he said that there is some progress toward the potential uh, dialogue at the technical level, at least. What are the prospects of this cooperation at the moment? Um, well, at the moment, um, of course, the internal problems uh, within the EU and dealing as EU with the consequences of the pandemic, they take precedence over a lot of, let's say, broader international issues. Um, well, that's just a fact. And uh, with the new commission, uh, which has posed itself as a, as a geopolitical commission, at least that's their intention, and to be a more geopolitical player, um, we have started thinking about also rethinking uh, well, the relations with China, but also the relations with Russia. Um, and with Russia, we have these five principles for the, for the um, relations with Russia. Uh, I think this will, this will remain. Uh, but at the moment, there is a whole process involving also think tanks, European External Action Service, looking at uh, those principles and how to implement them more effectively. And one concerns also um, the relations with the Eastern Partnership countries. But another very important one is, is about selective engagement. Uh, selective engagement with Russia. Uh, but also you could see if, if this can be done on the basis of uh, common interests, uh, selective engagement with also um, the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, so this is, at the moment, these are all elements under discussion. And one thing we are focusing on also is um, because what we see is also increased uh, bilateralism. So countries, member states of the Eurasian Economic Commission striking its own bilateral deals with China, for example, under the Belt and Road, but also developing its own bilateral, more intensive bilateral relations with the EU, specifically Kazakhstan with the Enhanced Cooperation Partnership Agreement, uh, Armenia with SIPA. Um, so we are, what we are in, in the discussions, one element is to square. So how do, how do the, these countries themselves see their relations with the EU and what would they like us to do 
in the relationship with Eurasian Economic Union, uh, or do they only want to deal with the EU at a bilateral level? So this is still an, an, an open question. Um, and discussions, um, well, originally it was foreseen to have a, a fundamental discussion at the European Council, well, last week. But of course, this was completely taken over by all of these other issues. So we now hope to have this discussion, which will also have effects. Uh, we'll also be dealing with maybe a new relationship with the Eurasian Economic Union. That discussion will take place only in December. Uh, but so it is, the, the thinking goes on, um, but I mean, there are no conclusions yet. Um, and it also depends uh, partly what I said about what individual member states of the Eurasian Economic Union, also like Belarus, what do they want to, to get out of this relationship with the EU and what they want us to do with how to engage or not to engage in, in, in which sectors with the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, and yes, this would be an interest-based uh, discussion, um, and uh, there, is, there is opposition. A number of, of uh, countries are more hardline towards Russia, see the Eurasian Economic Union primarily as a political Russian project, um, but it also affects, uh, of course, the, the, the non-Russian member states, and, and that's what we constantly keep repeating in this whole discussion. Uh, but uh, most important is what, what would countries like Kazakhstan, Armenia, Belarus, what do they want us to get out of this discussion? To which, what, what serves their interest best? Uh, because we would like to, well, to, to make it easier for them to have good trade relations with, with all sides, no choosing, no losing. Um, and uh, well, to be able to serve their national interests, their sovereignty, as, as best as possible. Can I clarify quickly? In principle, what you said, Tony, sounds just like it sounded last year, the year before last. Would that be correct to say that even with that message about a new geopolitical role of the Commission, still the question of the potential interaction between EU and the Eurasian Economic Union remains to be highly political in terms of, in that political sense, as we understood it, uh, of EU versus Eurasian Economic Union in the past. Not that Euro uh, European Commission starts to view Eurasian Economic Union more pragmatically how, to, how this cooperation with the EA, EU can strengthen European Union and its geopolitical position in the world. So far, there is no thinking of this nature, right? Um, well, what we don't have is a consensus among member states. So there are clear divisions in opinions between certain groups of member states, uh, which uh, tend to see the Eurasian Union as a purely Russian imperial project, and others who uh, take, uh, which take a more pragmatic stance and say, listen, we have some common interests, uh, not only with Russia, but also with the, uh, the non-Russian uh, members of European, uh, of the Eurasian Economic Union, and we should simply move forward on the basis of our own interests uh, and, and find a form of selective engagement which serves uh, our interests best. And then also the China dimension comes in and that has given an extra boost to these discussions. And what does this mean for the broader relations with China? And uh, uh, yeah, there. I, I think, um, I hope that we will have some little steps, pragmatic steps forward, um, agreed by, uh, by the end of the year. It is with great sadness that I say that our, we have run out of time already, but just a few more minutes of your time will We'll go over time. We have another question from Mr. Nazarenka, Artem Nazarenka, which answers the following. How would you assess the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis on the military situation in the uh, Eurasian Economic Union region? It uh, somewhat changes the focus of our discussion, but if any of the speakers is prepared to answer this, I have another more standard question for you before you answer this we always try to look at some possible recommendations, be it recommendations for the EAEU as an organization or as an institution or 
specific member states who are members of the Eurasian Economic Union within this new conditions and environment, the geopolitical environment, uh, first of all, related to the pandemic and its impacts. So as a resume, could each of the speakers very briefly make any potential recommendations, both for the Eurasian Economic Union and for its member states in view of this pandemic? I understand that it sounds too general and too vague, and one of the recommendations which is self-evident for all, not only for the Eurasian Economic Union, but any other integration institution, is to continue with the integration project, which through the synergy effect will uh, ensure good results for others. But maybe you can come up with something uh, less self-evident. So let's go in the same order as we started. We'll start with Andrei Rusakovich then. Thank you very much. Perhaps I will repeat what I've already said. It is the balance between national development strategies of member states of the Eurasian Economic Union and the development strategy for the development of the Eurasian Economic Union as a whole. Here we need to set forward more ambitious goals. I believe that if we decide to reach new frontiers here, and develop the capacities of member states of Eurasian Economic Union. And uh, here we need to rely, first of all, on new technologies, new sectors, and the second question on how uh, feasible this ambition is. Thank you very much. Thomas? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to Kazakhstan, I, um, I have to say, um, it does not make sense to me to let one quarantine follow the next quarantine. What is uh, what is happening at the moment? We, is, uh, we need a strategy which uh, combines um, issues of uh, taking uh, care and security on, on health issues, but also to take into account um, uh, the needs of the economy, the society which is suffering, and the education. For example, um, when I look to Germany, more and more universities say we will do teaching 50% online, 50% offline, things like this. They, in, in Kazakhstan, they close completely down the semester and say, okay, uh, just online a semester for uh, the, um, until the end of the year. Uh, I think uh, the damage in education is so big. All the freshmen coming to university at the moment, we have, they have no clue about academic life so far. And uh, uh, we have to find a solution, not only uh, these perspective lift lockdowns, we have to find solution which also takes into account the econ economy needs, the needs in education and the society needs. And uh, when I come to the European Union, of course, because uh, when we go on like this here, we will have a damage, big damage in, uh, in, the, uh, in the economy and in the society. And then it's a question, um, where does the money come from to recover this? And the money should not come uh, only from China because then we have new dependencies. And so coming to the European Union with the last sentence, it's a question about if we manage it in the European Union to undertake, uh, uh, to, to, to enrich the, uh, the uh, connect connectivity strategy, which is, which is so far a little bit uh, a piece of paper with budget. Yeah, um, and uh, with a real budget, which brings perspective to this region, to countries like Kazakhstan and so on, uh, because only uh, um, uh, the state of, uh, of the uh, connectivity at the moment, connectivity strategy, that is not, to, uh, not enough to give an answer to the new Silk Road and so to the Belt and uh, Road Initiative. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Elena, you have the floor. If I may, I believe that if the Eurasian Economic Union intends to implement at least the plans that they have agreed on at the moment, if they will find all these financial and human resources to do that, that will be the biggest and most important victory over coronavirus for us. The documents that we 
and discussed contained a lot of good statements. And the September strategy also will create additional opportunities for subsequent integration and development. The only thing to add here, I fully agree with Andrei Rusakovich that we need to develop those sectors, high tech sectors that we can develop. We don't suggest developing everything at one fell swoop like other countries of the world maybe or other integration environments, but the bigger emphasis should be put on SMEs because overcoming of these social problems that the COVID brought in largely depend on the role of SMEs, small and medium sized enterprise. Naturally, here we need to coordinate national programs, first of all, in this kind of engagement to maintain and strengthen the small and medium sized enterprise because they were struck the hardest and will continue to suffer if there will be next waves of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Tony. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, I fully agree with what Thomas has said about a connectivity strategy and that we need a bigger budget to make a difference. It is, after all, the European answer to the Belt and Road Initiative. And well, Kazakhstan still has a special place in my heart since I was posted there in the, in the late 1990s, so still keep some good memories. Um, uh, about about other issues, I think um, we should make a serious effort, and, and whether that is on the level of EU Eurasian Economic Union or more, let's say, on a bilateral level between the EU and member states of the Eurasian Economic Union, um, to um, try to work more closely together on health issues, uh, also in the context of the World Health Organization. I think that is that is very much needed nowadays, and. The European Union is make, trying to make an effort and to contribute to the, uh, to the WHO organization because after all we are still in the middle of this pandemic and we don't even know whether there will be a second wave. Um, other areas um, are um, about, well, we still think about greening our economy, about the Green Deal, um, about digitalization of the economy. I think also there we should try in a, in a pragmatic way to find uh, platforms for, for cooperation. And, and well, whether that is in, on the level of the Eurasian Economic Union, whether it's in the competence of the Eurasian Economic Commission, or whether we could do this uh, by working more closely together with, uh, with individual member states, specifically the, the, um, uh, our partners in the uh, um, Eastern Partnership. Well, that we should that remains to be seen, but I think these are issues where we where we should cooperate, uh, not only the, dealing with the immediate effects of uh, uh, of the pandemic, but also with now the longer term effects and and using this to well restructure our economies to to make them more green, more sustainable, um, and do this not only by ourselves, but try to to broaden cooperation in these fields uh, as much as possible. Thank you very much. Once again, I would like to thank once again our all our speakers for their time and readiness to share their ideas before we say goodbye to each other. We shall summarize the results. There are a lot of useful ideas shared today generally for our project. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to actively use it by the end of the year when we shall prepare the uh, final papers or releases for this project. Very briefly, I will highlight some of the thesis. Of course, they're not exhaustive or much more ideas were voiced. And I will remind you that there is a very good publication prepared by our authors. I invite our viewers to read them on our site. So we have mentioned that uh, the Eurasian Economic Union proved to be totally unprepared for these challenges uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Neither were prepared for COVID-19 pandemic, uh, all other integration organizations like the EU. So it's not like a negative characteristic for the Eurasian Economic Union. Another question is that how countries and the Eurasian Economic Union institutions can adopt themselves to the new realities and find maybe sometimes unique opportunities 
which will prove to be beneficial in future. At the same time, the long existing question about the national and supranational uh, within Eurasian integration has become ever more relevant because of obvious reasons. Similar thing happened within the EU, maybe because of the recent uh, establishment of the Eurasian Economic Union is uh, taken more emotionally, both at political and expert level discussion, but we need to show certain understanding, but it doesn't negate the need to find possible solutions. In the same way, uh, it relates to other problems, which people uh, keep hearing about, like common markets and the discussions conducted on the one hand between Russia and Kazakhstan, on the other hand between uh, Belarus and Armenia due to well-known reasons, countries of different economic structures and different interests. Again, uh, pandemic has made this more acute and pronounced, not the pandemic itself, but rather dropping uh, energy prices so we can uh, make a long-term conclusion that without any movement forward on this subject matter, Eurasian integration will continue to slowly uh, stand still. Two last them thematic blocks that we covered, the EU versus Eurasian Economic Union. We see that the Eurasian Economic Union show, continues to show high interest to this subject matter, despite the fact that many uh, public officials are uh, kind of frustrated about this so far. We are, it's not clear whether the EU, within the context of a pandemic, and all the processes which one way or another will push the EU to be more active in its international positioning. So far, we're, it's not clear whether there will be a document or agreement to start at least a selective discussion with the Eurasian Economic Union. And the very last thing, what awaits Eurasian Economic Union within the this uh, new hot conflict between uh, United States and China is uh, the chief question of our project and uh, in terms of diplomatic and geopolitical issues that will be remain to be a key subject matter both for the Eurasian Economic Union and the EU and the whole world but at least we managed to agree that in the future I mean this, this conflict is recognized and is being assessed both in terms of the challenge to the Eurasian economic integration and total uncertainty, the key question will be how the Eurasian Economic Union member states within this union and the cooperation with the third countries will be able to find a perfect balance within this conflict between the United States and China. Basically, I would end our seminar on this rather abstract note. I would like to thank all our speakers and thank all the viewers of this discussion in Zoom and Facebook. The day tomorrow, the day after tomorrow maybe, we're going to have a press release or rather we will edit this uh, video feed to make it more visually appealing and we'll post it on the web pages of uh, Minsk Dialogue and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. You're welcome to review them again. I would like to thank our partners, represented by uh, Jakob Fernstein and other colleagues, and also would like to thank our interpreter, who have, show, have shown patience to such quick speakers as myself. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening, and see you next time. Next week, we're going to speak about the United Kingdom.